So, today on the way to church, what was going through your head? What were you thinking about on the way to church today? On the way to work this week, you went, well, some of you, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's when you woke up in the morning, but let's say you had jobs and you're driving to your jobs. What's going through your head as you're driving to work? Some of you might drive long distances. You get a lot of time to think. This week, how many of you thought about um, Alexander the Great at any point in time? (laughs) I didn't until this morning when I was thinking, I was like, I'm just going to throw this name out there. Because Alexander the Great was very great at one time. And many people in the world talked about him. He wanted to be known probably forever. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to be known forever. I didn't think of Nebuchadnezzar this week. I did not think of Nebuchadnezzar, even though he was a great man at one time. How many of you this week thought about Joe Biden or Donald Trump? I will say yes, sometimes I did because they pop up on my, uh, on my social media feed and I just can't help it, they're right there in my face and so I think about them. But a lot of people would like not to think about them. I got a text message this week, did you know that O.J. Simpson passed away this week? I said, I did not. I haven't thought about O.J. Simpson in quite some time, probably 1994 when I was a student and, and I remember he was going through this big trial and, and since that time I have not really thought about him. At one time, a lot of people did because he was a professional sports hero. And, you know, people right now, both in church and out of church, have a lot of folks they think about. Most of the people that we think about are probably living. We don't spend a lot of time thinking about the dead. Uh, I didn't think about Adam and Eve this week. Uh, Not that I shouldn't. They're the first parents that we've all come from. Uh, I didn't think about Noah this week. Even though he's in the Bible, that wasn't something that came to mind this week. Partly because these people are dead. But there's one person I thought about a lot this week, and that's Jesus. Jesus is not dead. He's no longer in the tomb. At least by faith, I believe that. And I've seen evidence in my life how Jesus has worked. So I believe he is alive and well, and I I know he's ministering uh, on our behalf in the most holy place. And he sent the Holy Spirit that we're going to talk about today. But I thought about Jesus every day this week. I don't think there was one day this week that I did not think about Jesus. There are a lot of other people that I did not think about, but I thought about Jesus this week, and I hope you did too. There are a lot of people in this world that don't think about Jesus. There are a lot of people uh, that don't even think about him on Sabbath and on Sunday. Jesus is forgotten by probably the majority of our world. And Jesus is about to come back, and he loves these people. And they need to know they have a choice to think about him, this one who created and loves them, or to be stressed and anxious about everything else and be thinking about all the other people who give them no hope. There's no hope in basketball and football and baseball, and these heroes cannot fix the problems that I have in my life. There's no hope in the politicians, and they're not fixing the problems I have in my life. And there's no hope in me today outside of the word that I'm going to share with you. The scripture we read today, It's in your bulletin. I also want to look it up in my Bible because I want to read the next verse as well. Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 1. I think it's the first scripture I have there on your Bible study sheet that I wanted to look at today. Zechariah 10, 1 and 2. And here it says, Ask the Lord for rain. Who prayed for rain this week? Because we got a lot of it. (laughs) Ask the Lord for rain. In the time of the latter rain, the Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. Now, this Bible verse isn't about literal rain, even though many will take it as being about literal rain. And we know it's not about literal rain when you look at the context of the next verse. Now, in Isaiah, I'm going to jump there really quick. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. So uh, this will help us put this passage in context. But Isaiah 44, verse 3 says, I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessings on your offspring that they will spring up among the grass like willows by the watercourses. So God is speaking of a spiritual rain that he pours out by his Holy Spirit. What does rain do? And we're going to go from the physical to the spiritual. Jesus told a lot of parables when he takes us from the physical to the spiritual. So what does rain do? What's that? Refreshes. I didn't write that down. Thank you. Rain is very refreshing. 
It's very refreshing. I haven't mowed my grass yet. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have mowed your grass. My wife looked out in her backyard and she says, I don't see the German Shepherd anymore. It's time to mow the grass. It's like, yeah, it probably is. And I said, you can look at other parts of the yard and Noelle can go out there and you won't find her anymore either. Because we have grass in some places that really it's about three and a half, four feet tall. It's gotten that high in certain spots. But we have other spots that it hasn't grown an inch. Same rain. The rain has fallen on the whole entire yard, but you got parts of the yard where the grass is just taken up, and it's like, wow, that's really tall. It's coming to my waist. And other parts, it's just dirt. But one part's because of me, because I don't back up in my driveway. I pull off in the, the grass, and so I've made a, a very hard mud track there. And so grass just doesn't grow there. No, ma no matter how much rain falls, it just, it's very stagnant. I dug up part of my yard a few years ago because I wanted to try a garden, and it's pretty stagnant. It doesn't grow anymore. And I was just thinking, because we're talking about rain falling. If you look in the book of Joel, chapter 2, it says that in the last day, God's going to pour out his rain on all flesh. So today it's not just talking about, you know, are you ready for God to pour out his rain? God's pouring it out. He's been pouring it out. Ellen White said in her days in the early church, God was pouring out the rain. She said the latter rain's falling on some right now. But I don't want to look at it. In that point, is it falling on some or falling on others? I think it's falling on all. The question is, am I ready to receive it? As I said, I have property, and some grass is receiving it and growing. It's doing, it's thriving, and others, it's, it's not growing at all. The ground's not ready. Is the ground of your heart ready to receive the rain? That's why I think the sermon title, what I said, uh, ready for the rain? The rain's falling. The question is, are you ready for it? Are you ready to receive it and have it do the work in your life that God wants it to do? Because if you're not ready to receive it, it's going to have no effect on you. And it's said in the spirit of prophecy that the rain was falling all, all around the church, and, and, and some were actually uh, receiving it, and some were not. And don't wait for the whole church to be ready to receive it, because it's said that, that that will never happen. So don't say, well, you know, when this group of people are ready to receive it, maybe I'll... And, and as young people, don't say... I'm going to wait till I get older to receive the latter rain. Do you know how hard it is to change habits the older you get? You think, well, I can get rid of this habit. This is just something I enjoy as a teenager. But when I get to be 22, I won't enjoy it anymore. No, you still enjoy it. Your habits don't disappear just because you get older. Those things you loved as a kid, you still love. Those bad vices you hung on to as a teenager, you still have those and you struggle with them. So it's better to remember your creator when you're young so you're not battling with those. You think when you get 40, all of a sudden those things just fall away? No, it's a struggle and it's a surrender day by day. So it's better to be ready to receive Jesus today. Receive him when you're 6 and 7, 8, 12, 13, 14. Don't wait and say, okay, I'll give these things up later and when I'm in my 40s or 50s, I'll get my life ready then. No. There's a lot of people who don't get their life ready then. They can't overcome those habits anymore. They're so ingrained in them. It's just second nature, and they don't want to give those vices up. And so when the rain falls, their heart is hardened, and they can't receive, and they can't grow the fruit of the Spirit. Why is this rain so important? Joel chapter 3, 14 to 16. I'm just going to, since we're late on time. But it says that there are multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. No, it is decision time, and it is the rain that is going to bring about our decision one way or another. You know, in the book of Acts, the early rain fell. And you need rain to grow. And if the gardens are growing, I know my mom grows gardens. At the beginning of a garden, at the beginning of the garden, you want rain to fall so those seeds can start germinating. And at the end, you want the rain to come again, right before the harvest. And so it was vital for the Holy Spirit to rain down in the church of Acts. And so Peter preaches a sermon, and he uses Joel in Acts chapter 2, and he said, hey, do you know Joel prophesies in the last days that uh, the rain will fall on all flesh? And he says how people are going to have visions and dream dreams, and he talks about the signs and the stars. And then he goes on to do this discourse about Jesus, their Messiah, and how he came and, and how he was killed uh, to forgive their sins. And they're like, okay, what are we supposed to do? And what does Peter tell them? Do you remember? He says, Repent. He says, repent. Acts chapter 2, that's what Peter tells them. I'm actually going to look at the verse myself. I don't have it memorized, but I want to give you his exact words. As they said, what are, we, what are we to do? And it says here, as Peter preaches this sermon, and he's talking about the, the Holy Spirit raining down on Jesus' sacrifice for them, and it says, they were cut to the heart. 
You know, as the Holy Spirit comes and falls in our heart, it actually quickens us to make a decision. It says, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what are we supposed to do? He's like, you've got to make a decision, is what he says. You've got to decide. He says, you need to repent, and every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you will receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are far off, as many are, as many as the Lord our God will call. And you know what they did? They had a choice. They didn't have to do that. But they chose, yes, we will be baptized. We will give our hearts to Jesus. I read a a Facebook post from one of my pastor friends this week, and he says, how many people do you wonder in the Adventist church are really converted? In fact, I think he wrote down, not many. He didn't say, I wonder. He said, not many in the Adventist church I come across are really converted. So there are a lot of Adventists who were baptized as young kids or even as adults, and they come to church, and they listen to sermons, and they take up offices, and they're parts of programs, but their hearts are not converted, which means that the world is still there. It means they haven't really repented and turned from their worldly ways. They come to church. They're worldlings who come to church. And so they come to church on Sabbath and live for the world the next six days of the week. Now, you know when the Holy Spirit fell on the church of Acts, that didn't happen because it talks about what they did throughout the week. It said throughout the week they were getting together and they were studying and fellowshipping and eating together and, and praying together. It was like prayer meeting seven days a week. They were getting ready to take the gospel to the world. Why? Because they thought Jesus was coming back. And Jesus told his disciples, hey, I'm going to heaven, but I'm going to prepare this place and I'm going to come back. That's great. Let's get the world ready. They were working more for the second coming than we are. Why? Because the latter rain fell and their hearts were ready. But not every heart was ready. Because in Acts chapter 7, Stephen's given a sermon too to the church leaders. I'm not going to read the whole sermon, but he gives a sermon that should convict a heart. Because he's saying, look, I'm going to give you a sermon of your history. And how God has still loved you despite your, your hard-heartedness and despite your choices to, to stand against him. And it gets to verse 52 of Acts chapter 7. Actually, verse 51. And he says, after he, and this is talking to the leaders. This is talking to the church leaders. This is talking to me. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in the heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. So what are they doing? They're resisting the, the early rain. The pouring of the Holy Spirit, that's the rain I'm talking about. They're resisting the rain. And he said, you always resist the Holy Spirit just as your fathers did. And so I'll say this to the young people today. If your parents are resisting the rain, you don't have to resist it with them. If you go home and your parents are interested in spiritual things and they're just busy with their work and their jobs and, and saying, okay, kids, just go outside and play. We just want to spend time on our computer. We want to watch something. You can have the rain even if, they, even if they don't want it. It's offered to you too. But here Stephen says, you know what? You resist the rain. You resist the Holy Spirit just as your fathers did. And as he said this, did, did their hearts get softened? No, it says that they put their hands in their ears. They stuffed their ears, said, we don't want to hear this, and they took him out and stoned him. So they did to him just like he said you did to all the other prophets. Stephen was just a deacon. He wasn't even one of the 12 disciples. Jesus said, you know, if they, if they persecute me when the branch is green, how much more will they do when the branch is not green? So the latter rain was vital for the early church because we need the rain to grow, don't we? Someone said we need the rain to be refreshed. If you want to have a Christian life that's not stale, and I have a lot of people, I don't like reading the Bible. It's so boring. Well, then you don't have the rain. I'm letting you know that. If reading the Bible is a bore to you, you need to ask God to soften your heart so that you can have the Spirit rain down because spending time with Jesus should not be a bore. The Word of God should be the most exciting thing that you could possibly put into your heart or mind. Now, I have some folks that come to me and like, we don't want anything to do with the spirit of prophecy. Just, we just want to have the Bible. Well, what have you learned from the Bible this week? They have nothing to share. Well, then you don't want that either. A lot of folks that have no interest in, in the spirit of prophecy don't have interest in the Word of God. Now, we have a billboard that's up. Maybe you've seen, have you seen that billboard yet this week, right by Jack's? Now, we've passed this book out 
we try to to every home in in uh, Dunlap. I hope there's some people who are driving to Jackson aren't from Dunlap, and they just see it and they write and said, would you send us one of these? But maybe there's some more folks from Dunlap who, who, who would like to know where we are in Earth's history, where we've come from from the time of Jesus in the early church and where we are now. It gives a whole history of the whole Protestant Reformation. You might say, well, why, why do we need another book? Why can't the Bible be enough? The Bible doesn't have the Protestant Reformation in it. It hasn't happened yet. It doesn't have stories about Luther. It doesn't have stories about Wycliffe and those people who, who surrendered their lives and sacrificed so we could even have the Bible. So this is a great historical book to know where we came from and how Protestantism came out of Catholicism. That's not told in God's word, but God has given us light. This book is definitely a, a wonderful book. As you can say, look at all the sources that were used to show that this is historical. Now, if you have a hard time reading a big book, and I, I shared this morning, I said the sad thing is we pass this book out to every family in Dunlap, but there's probably people who pass it out that have never read it. There are people who pass out Gideon's Bibles that have never read them. <laughs> Don't miss out by saying, man, I share the word of God by handing out a pamphlet, <laughs> but I never received the word of God. Make sure that you're spending time in God's word, not just sharing it. That you're, if you're passing out a book that you've actually spent some time in it. And read the last seven chapters, chapter 36 to 42. If there's nothing else, read that. It, it tells you where we're at and where we're heading. So we're about to give a loud cry. And the loud cry is to go out to a group of people who's in the valley of decision. And they have a choice to make on how they're going or what they're going to do with this rain that's falling. Because the rain is falling. And they can either harden their hearts more or they can soften their hearts and they can receive it. I was thinking today, can you think of stories that, that had to, to deal with, in scripture that had to deal with, with rain and sharing? One in particular, Elijah, that's right. Elijah was living during a time where everyone was worshiping idols. The second verse to Zechariah, which I forgot, and I'm sorry I didn't read it. I'm not gonna go back there and read it really quick because I should have. It shows that there's a choice. You can choose to have the rain or you can choose to listen to your idols. You're like, how can you listen to idols? You know, most of our idols are actually living people. They are. I know more people who's like, I'm not going to listen to you because I know what someone said on YouTube. All right, well, I don't want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to what the Bible says. <laughs> Did you know that this girl on TikTok said this? I don't care, really. And I don't care if you're listening to what I'm saying. Go to God's word. It's amazing. You throw, some, so, throw something on Instagram, and everyone takes it as truth. It's a YouTube video. It's got to be true because it's on YouTube. It's on Facebook. My friend said it. No. You made your friend an idol. You, made, you can make pastors idols. But here he says, uh, after he's talking about the latter rain, it's going to fall on all the grass of the field. But then he says, but the idols speak delusion. And the diviners envision lies, and they tell false dreams, and they comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wind or wind their way like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. So we're to give this loud cry. Elijah gave it on Mount Carmel. The world finally got to the point during Elijah's time where Israel, look, we've got to make a decision. We haven't had rain for three and a half years. Something's got to change. Something's got to give. You know, during that time of no rain, they were still praying to Baal, the Baal worshipers. The prophets of God were in hiding because their lives were being threatened by Jezebel. And finally, Elijah comes out and says, hey, we're going we're gonna to have a confrontation. It's now time for you to make a decision. That's what he says. He's like, today you're going to make a decision. If God is God, choose him. If he's not God, then choose Baal. And we're going to see what the true fire is. Fire represents the Holy Spirit, too. And there's going to be a false fire and a false rain that's falling at the same time as a true fire and true rain. In fact, it's falling in churches right now that aren't truly uh, God-fearing biblical churches. They'd be like, I want to be part of this church because that pastor is so funny. He tells so many good jokes, so many good stories. I, want, I like to listen to them. And there's some even friends who say, Jesus told a lot of jokes. Like, where's that at? He told some parables. Yeah, but he told that to be sarcastic. It doesn't say he told that story, and, and, and John says he told that, and in parentheses, he was doing this to be sarcastic. Jesus wasn't some jokester, sarcastic person. He was here to tell people about 
The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is not sarcasm. The kingdom of heaven is not based on a joke. And yet there are people who flock to these type of ministries that make them laugh or make them feel good or that are entertaining. Jesus didn't come to entertain mankind. But they love and they worship these pastors or these singers that, that just, oh, we like this music because it really, it sounds a lot like the worldly music that I used to like. I was sharing in the early service, uh, there was a singer that sang in an almost satanic uh, metal rock band. I don't know if he'd call it satanic, but I kind of thought that when I was growing up. I think it was from Alice in Chains. Don't go and check it out. I didn't listen to that band, and I'm glad I didn't. And so Alice Cooper was, was there saying, I went to a pastor and I said, I think I need to change my life. But my pastor told me, do you think God makes mistakes? God put you in that band for a reason. He said, so just keep playing and keep singing, but just try to be a little different than all the other folks. He's like, so that's what I've done. And I thought, here was a guy who had a chance to change, and a pastor kept him from doing it. And now he's okay with it, and he has a false sense of security. He's not receiving the rain. He sang the same songs, the same lyrics. He just didn't dress up quite as scary. (laughs) He didn't totally surrender. And there are people who think, well, as long as I give God half of my life, I'm probably okay. God's not going to settle for 50%. God's not going to settle for 90%. We can't love God and mammon, one verse says, but we can't love God and the world. We can't love God and the world. You know, the Holy Spirit is raining down, blanketing the earth. Why are so many people, even in churches, not receiving it? It's not like he's not accessible or available. They're not receiving it. And Jesus says in, in John 14, 15 to 17, you can look that up a little bit later. But he said that the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit, which he calls the helper. He says they don't know him, they can't receive him. And he won't abide in them. And then he goes on to say, because the world loves the things of the world. 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the struggle. Do I love God or do I love the world? Because I can't love both. You can't, have, you can't have two girlfriends at the same time. You can't have two boyfriends. You can't have two loves at the same time. You've got to have one love of your life. And God wants to be that love. I had a cousin growing up that I looked up to so much. He was about five or six years older than me. He was so good at sports. I I wasn't six foot tall, but I wanted to get to be six foot tall because he could dunk a basketball. And I thought, I hope one day I can get to be six foot and I can dunk a basketball. He could play tennis awesomely. I thought, I hope one day I can get really good and and play tennis and be as good as him. I actually got there because when I got to be a teenager, we played and I actually beat him. He got so mad. He said, we're playing again tomorrow so I can beat you again. Okay. He was such a good bike rider. He could do wheelies and he could pop a wheelie and ride his wheelie down the street. I was like, I want to be like him. He would go to church on Sabbath and he would sing up front. He had a great voice. He would get up front of Zanesville Avenue Church, and he sang a song like, man, I hope one day I can get up and sing a song like my cousin. He worked at summer camp in front of all the kids and could tell great funny stories, and and he could entertain all the kids, and I thought, one day I hope I can be like him, and I I did. I worked the same summer camp he did. But what I didn't know is I was trying to imitate my cousin and not Jesus. And even though my cousin went to Mount Vernon Academy, and even though he, he led at summer camps, and even though he was involved in church, he was just as equally involved in the world. And my cousins got me enthralled with rock and roll music, which didn't lead me to Jesus. They got me enthralled with wanting to watch movies that were far worse than even non-Christians should be watching. And I didn't realize that even though they were in church, they were leading me astray. And I had made my cousin my hero and not Jesus. I was imitating my idol, which I won't mention his name, but my cousin, and not Jesus. And I grew to believe that Jesus would save me 
It didn't matter if I held on to the world, but Jesus would save me even if I was in love with the world and in love with him. Jesus isn't going to force you to let go of the world. He's not going to do it. But he is going to woo you. Have you heard the word woo before? I heard this as a kid that I'm praying that the Holy Spirit woos you. What? What's wooing? As a young, youngster, I didn't even know. I was like, I don't even like the word woo. <laughs> woo woo. <laughs> but they said it. And so, you know what? I wanted to know that. So I actually looked at this week because I said, tomorrow I'm going, to tell, I'm going to tell folks, we need to pray that the Holy Spirit woos our families. Well, what does that mean? Thought about we use it from the pulpit. I'm sure young people are like, what? Why are you saying that word? Well, I typed it and I Googled it. What, what does it mean to woo? It actually is, uh, and I'm trying to think of the country that first used the word wooing, but it was what a young man would do to woo the woman he wanted to court. Wooing means that you're trying to win the heart of somebody. You're trying to convince them that they are the person for you and that, that you are the person for them, that you love them. So we're saying we want the Holy Spirit to woo you. We want him to convince you that Jesus is the Savior for you, that he wants you to be his bride. That's what he said. I'm coming back for my bride. He wants you to be the love of his life because he wants to be the love of your life. And so we're, when we're praying for the Holy Spirit to woo you, we're praying that the Holy Spirit will go after you with a zealous love saying, I'm going to win you. <laughs> I'm going to win you to me, and I'm going to show you. And how do young men try to win young ladies? Well, they just spend time with them. They say, we want to spend time with you. We want to talk with you. We, we want to shower you with gifts and with, with flowers and with cards. We love you. And the Holy Spirit's like, you know what? I want to spend time with you. I, I want you to be in my word. I want you to hear what I have to say to you. And I want you to talk to me. And I want you to know that I'm here for you any time that you want. And I love you. And I'm going to shower you with gifts and with love. And I'm going to meet all your needs. And I'm going to court you because I am the person for you. But the world's doing the same thing. It's trying to woo us too. It's like, hey, we're the person for you. We'll be here for you for a little while until we don't want you anymore. We'll be here for you until you get old and we can't use you on the, the front of a magazine or on YouTube because no one wants to watch a 60-year-old on YouTube. I was thinking about entertainers today. You know what? Entertainment, and even sports players, it lasts them 40 years, but as soon as you can't play, get out of here. You're off the team. These guys become homeless. It's like, man, alive, these guys did so much for, for the sports team and now they're, they're, they're living out of garbage cans. Fortune and fame lasts so, it's so short. But God says, I'm not giving you this short love. I'm giving you a love that lasts for eternity. And whether you're 6, 18, or 108, I still love you just the same. And I still want to have a relationship with you like no one else does. And we get to make that choice. Do I want to accept God as my, uh, what do I say, my husband? It's hard to say that as a man. But do I want to accept God as the person that I'm going to commit my life to in a covenant relationship forever? I do. Why? Because he loves me. He loves me even when I'm loving the world. A lot of people, you know, as soon as you switch, and like, well, I kind of love you, but I want to spend time with this other guy. Like, fine, take him, I'm moving on. Even when you're loving the world, God says, I still love you. And I'm still here for you, and even if you want to come back to me, I will still take you. Even though you've spent a lot of your life loving somebody else, I still love you that much. And my covenant love does not change. But there are so many in the church that think today, they have a false idea of the latter reign and the Holy Spirit, and they think, well, I can love the world and love God, and it's all good, but it doesn't work that way. In fact, if you love the world and the things of the world and still want to love all the entertainers and, and, and all of the things that the world has to offer, the latter rain has not fallen uh, on you. you. Well, maybe it has. You haven't received. I'll just say this. You have not received the latter rain. Last Day Events is a great little book to read if you get a chance. I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs about a likeness of Christ and a likeness of Christ and character. So you can know the trends, but if you don't have a likeness of Christ and character, it doesn't matter what you knew. I'm convinced there'll be people in the church who knew a whole lot, more than me, and they could share a lot when it comes to prophecies and knowing Daniel and Revelation. And, but if you don't have a likeness of Jesus, if, if, if you haven't given him your heart in courtship, then you haven't received the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to read this one verse. The seal of God will never be placed upon the forehead of an impure man or woman. If, if you're keeping the impurities of the world in your hearts, you're not going to get the seal of God, which is the Holy Spirit. It will never be placed on the forehead of the ambitious, world-loving man or woman. So if your heart is ambitious and world-loving and you want to make a name for yourself down here, you'll get it, but it'll be for a very short time. 
but you won't have the seal of God. It will never be placed on the forehead of men or women of false tongues or deceitful hearts. So we can come to church, and young people know it more than others. Like me, there's a lot of hypocrites in church. There are. And eventually we have to stop being actors. That's all it means. Hypocrite just means you're an actor, you're a pretender. And so just like people act out in Hollywood, we act in church. And we teach our young people to be actors. All who receive the seal must be without spot before God. Candidates for heaven. Love is expressed in obedience and perfect love casts out all fear. Those who love God have the seal of God in their foreheads and work the works of God. Great chapter, The Likeness and Character of Christ. If you have last day events, a great book to check out. So, quickly, I'm just going to spend about three minutes to go through these last five points, and I'm just going to go over the points. Five reasons why we need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Five reasons why we need it. It's available to us. I need to receive it. That's really what it is. The latter rain is falling right now. It's not something we do. We've got to wait and pray for it. It's falling. You've got to pray to receive it. God, I know it's falling. It says in your word it's falling. The spirit of prophecy says it's falling. Have you received it? So you've got to ask yourself, and you haven't received it, then you've got to pray. You've got to pray. John 16, verse 5 to 11, it says that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Have you ever run to some, into somebody, it could even be a Christian friend or a non-Christian friend, and you, you share with them some truth that you know they're struggling with? You're like, you know what? You, you've got to really give this up. And then their answer is, I'm not convicted yet. You know what? you really got to get victory over smoking or drinking. I'm not convicted. When the Holy Spirit convicts me that alcohol is wrong, then I'll do it. When the Holy Spirit convicts me these video games are wrong, then I'll give them up. When, when the Holy Spirit convicts me that the entertainment I'm, I'm involved with is wrong, then I'll give it up. If you are not convicted to a thus saith the Lord, then you have not received the lot of rain. So if there's something the Lord has made plain to you, in fact, when Jesus talks about those who have received the Holy Spirit, the verse before that, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then he goes on to talk about the Holy Spirit. If there's a commandment that you're not keeping intentionally yet, saying, well, I'm not convicted of coveting yet, I'm not convicted of not lying yet. If there's a commandment that you're not convicted of, then the Holy Spirit hasn't done his work because the Holy Spirit's job is to do what? Convict of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. If you're not convicted that we're in the hour of judgment, which we know prophecy says, then the, the latter rain hasn't fallen in your heart yet or you haven't received it yet because we know we're in the hour of judgment. If you think, no, that's going to happen 30 years from now. No, it's today. The Bible says so. Since 1844, we've been in the hour of judgment. If you think it's not there that, yet, then the latter rain hasn't totally, you haven't totally received it because the Holy Spirit convicts us of truth and of righteousness and of judgment. So that's number one. The first reason why you need it because the Holy Spirit's going to bring conviction and if you're not being convicted, it means you're pushing back. And the Holy Spirit will say, okay, I'll, I'll move out for a while, but I'll, I'll keep coming back and woo you again as people ask or as people pray. It's important that we pray for our family members to be wooed. Because then the Holy Spirit says, okay, I'll go and court them again. I'll, I'll work hard on their hearts. John 16, verse 13. Um, actually, look this one up. Let me and John for a little bit, but quickly. John 16, verse 13. It says that... When the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into what? All truth. Who leads us into truth? And not just some truth, all truth. And so if you're rejecting truth, then the latter rain's not going to be received in your heart. Satan's also going to bring in a lot of false truths in the end. And a lot of churches are presenting false truths. The final test is going to be over the Sabbath and Sunday. And we're going to talk about that in our, our little meeting here in just an hour and a half. There are churches all around us, and I hate to call them apostate, but in a way it is apostate because they rejected truth. They rejected light. I am friends with pastors who are Sunday pastors, and some know that the Sabbath is right. They know. But as of right now, they're still pushing back. They have not received a lot of rain yet. They haven't received it yet, but some of them will. And the last test is going to be that, you know, there are a lot of Sunday-keeping Christians all around us. Sabbath-keeping Christians are in minority, but one day this truth will be revealed to them because it's the hour of decision. Who's going to reveal that truth to them? We are, Sabbath-keepers are, because it's going to come to the forefront where our nation's going to say, we're going to create a law that makes people worship on Sunday, and we're going to say, hey, but that's not the right day. And all of a sudden, like, what? This is truth we've never heard of before. And we're willing to go to jail for that because we, we love Jesus so much we fall in love with him. It's like, 
This is our relationship with Jesus. He's our creator, and we spend this sacred time with him. This is our date day with Jesus. He's the love of our life, and we can't go against this. You're worshiping on a, a man-made day, a man-made holiday. There's nothing wrong with man-made holidays, but not if it comes in to, you know, contrast with me and my walk with Jesus. And there are going to be people who hear it for the first time. It's part of the loud cry. We're like, hey, guess what? There's something you haven't heard yet. That all Ten Commandments matter, not just nine. If you ask people on the other church that Ten Commandments matter, yes, they, may, they matter. But really, only nine matter to them. All ten matter. They're all a picture of God's character. And it's truth. It's present truth. But we kind of are silent about it for the most part because we don't want to offend people. But eventually, we're going to be the offense to the nation because we're not going to go along with the new rules to save the planet. And we have a choice at that time. Are we going to give the loud cry? Because our decision, and at that time, our decisions will be made known. You'll know if you're a true Adventist if you're just coming and sitting in the pews. I've got a lot of Adventist friends who come and sit in the pews at church, and then they're out going shopping afterwards. They come to church, and they, they have some fellowship at church, and then they're out of there because they got ball games and swim meets to go to. They're involved in all kinds of stuff, but they're still Seventh-day Adventist, but not really. The Sabbath is going to be a test for not just us, but for everybody. Do I love Jesus all the way? Am I completely surrendered? And here it says the Holy Spirit says what? He reveals to us some truth, all truth. So as truth comes, we have a choice to accept it or reject it. Acts 1.8 says, Jesus says to them, don't go out and witness yet because the Holy Spirit will give you power to witness. Not just in Dunlap, but wherever you're at. So when you go on vacation, you can still be a witness. Wherever you're at, wherever God has you, you're to be a witness for him. In your speech, in your dress, in your demeanor, in your joy. So if you're not a good witness, you probably haven't received the latter rain yet because the Holy Spirit gives you a boldness to, to live Jesus. Galatians 5, 16 to 25, it says, Walk in the Spirit, you will not do the lust of the flesh. If you're not having the fruits of the Spirit in your life, then no, you have not received the latter rain. My wife tells me sometimes, man, I go to church and there's so many people who don't smile ever. The second fruit, the fruit of the Spirit is Joy. Joy is not having a stern look and a frown on your face. Now, sometimes, yeah, you'll have a hard day. But let Sabbath turn that around because you get to leave that bad day in the past. You're like, yes, Jesus you reminded me that every day, as long as I have you, is a good day. Amen. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience. And I'll just go to the last one, self-control and kindness. If you do not have the fruits in your life, or it's actually one fruit. If you don't have the fruit in your life, then you have not received the latter rain. You're coming to church, but you haven't received the latter rain yet. It's still available. You've got to let God soften your heart so you start producing the fruit. Because a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So say, God, I want to produce your fruit so people know that I'm yours. Being a Sabbath keeper is not producing the fruit. <laughs> I've got to have more than that. The Jews were good Sabbath keepers, but they didn't produce the fruit. They weren't kind. They were not loving. They would kick a brother who was down. They put burdens on the youth and everybody else so they couldn't even, they couldn't even uh, live faithfully. There were so many burdens and so many rules. They created a hundred and, well, probably more than that, a thousand rules just to keep the Sabbath. And so no one could keep the Sabbath because there's a thousand rules and you're always breaking one. Do I have the fruit of the Spirit? And then finally, we need the Holy Spirit because in Ephesians 1, 13, Ephesians 4, 30 says the Holy Spirit is the one who seals us. The Holy Spirit seals us. And I thought more about that today. What does it mean to be sealed? I make my kids lunch most every day. And every day in lunch, I have these little Ziploc bags. <laughs> and I put their fruit in the bag, or I put whatever I'm giving them, I put it in these little bags and I seal it up. What does sealing do? Think about it. It preserves it keeps that food safe so I know that it's not going to fall out and get junk from their lunchbox all over it or they're not going to open it up, it's going to fall on the floor. If it does, it's still protected. Putting that food in that protective sealed bag protects that food from what's happening all around it. The time of trouble is going to come and it's going to be scary for people who are not sealed. The Adventists who are not sealed, it's going to be super scary. Why? Because you don't have the Holy Spirit's sealed protection. You haven't received the latter rain, which was available, and there's going to come a time for us where it's not available anymore. 
So that's why today, receive it while it's here. That's why this message is so important today. Receive the Holy Spirit while he's available. It's raining. It's raining right now, but the rain won't always be falling. It's going to be a time of famine in our, our land. It says not for food, but for hearing of the word of the Lord. This word won't be available to you much longer. So as you hear it, and if the Holy Spirit convicts, don't harden your hearts, but today accept it. Be sealed. We seal envelopes. Why do we seal those envelopes? To keep things secure. And to keep those documents from being tampered with. God wants to seal us so our faith is secure and no one will be able to tarnish that faith again. The devil will not be able to tamper with it. We are sealed and protected by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we've surrendered completely. We've surrendered completely. So in closing, before we sing our song, you have a work to do when you leave this place if the latter rain has fallen on you. If it hasn't, you still have a work to do too. You've got to go pray and say, Lord, I need the latter rain. I need to receive it. How can people believe what they have not heard? There are people in our community that, that have not experienced a lot of rain. They haven't received it. How, how can they receive it unless they've heard about it? How can they hear without someone who tells them? How can we tell them if we're not sent? We are sent. You're sent today. I'm sending you because God's sending us. How beautiful it's written. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That's the final message to the world. There's a rain that's falling. Do you want to receive it? There's a Holy Spirit that wants to woo you to Jesus because he loves you more than anybody else. What's your choice going to be? Father in heaven, today uh, we thank you for the extended rain that continues to fall. We know it won't always be falling here in this earth forever. That the time will come where the rain will not be available anymore. But right now it is, and we thank you for it. We thank you that your Holy Spirit wants to do marvelous things in our hearts and in our lives, that you want to show us how much Jesus loves us, that you want us to be in a relationship with Jesus that is better than anything that we could ask or imagine, that you want us to be free of the deceit and the lies of the world that, that doesn't want anything really from us out of love, but just wants to use us for what they can get out of us and just kick us to the curb afterwards. That's not our Savior, Jesus' is love. Father, we're thankful that the Holy Spirit will continue to woo us until the rain stops falling. So we have to listen to that still, small voice today as he says, this is the way, walk ye in it. Father, it's my prayer that during the weeks ahead that we will surrender those things that have kept us from receiving the rain. That we will allow you to um, take the things out of our hearts that are hardening our hearts so that we can receive you. So, Father, today, as again you knock at our heart's door, wanting to, to eat with us, it's my prayer that our hearts would be open to receive the truth of today, and that as we receive the latter rain, that we would go out and share this wonderful good news, the loud cry with those around us uh, that don't understand everything that, that you've given us. And, Lord, it's my prayer that when you come back, we'll be re ready to re receive you as our as our Lord and Savior, and will be a bride that uh, you can be proud of. And this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.